If you look at the world that we live in, you realize it's really incredible. I mean, look at all the arts, the sciences, the inventions, the ideas. It is endless. And the more that we look inward, the more we find. It's called being curious. And at this time, right now, you have access to more information right at your fingertips than any time in history. So come hunt and gather some collective knowledge as we embark on an endless journey in search of perspective, adding it to our big picture along the way. All you need is an open mind. You got it? Good. Because there is no time to waste when you are watching The Millennial Show. All right, what I'll tell you, man, we had a really fun time this week, man. Yeah, we did. We saw a lot of cool stuff. Um, and what really kicked it off was was the interview you actually caught up in Marquette yes. before you came home. Uh huh. Which was uh, the neuroscientist yeah. Jeff Nyquist. I couldn't believe we got him. Yeah, he's great, and he's a cognitive therapist. Yeah. And he's like cutting line I know. neuroscience right now. So it's what was really it like? Exciting. What was it like talking to him? Like, how did you approach him? How I approached him was actually. I was talking to him about like if there's any job openings at this virtual reality arcade, uh -huh. and we got talking and found out he owns a neural trainer next door, and so we started talking about that. And he's like, "Yeah, we could we could use some peer scientists over there, but it's kind of just I'm not qualified yet enough for that job." But right. Hopefully, in the future. Does he have a lot so. of people working there with him? He's actually outsourcing it to like L.A. So okay. He's got like very well-known game developers. So he's got the two businesses. He's got the uh, Virtual Reality Arcade and the Neuro Trainer. Yep. And he, he runs both of those. He runs both of them. And we were able to get in there, and you were able to get an interview. Yeah, it was and, awesome. And he's he, really cool and relaxed. Yeah. And just going with the flow. He's like, yeah, I just love trying to explain uh, what I'm doing here so it's easier for me. It, it's, it was really probably really cool talking to someone like a, that has that much knowledge in one area. Yeah. It was probably it was. really inspiring. You could and talk then, to him for hours. Yeah, and then he let you, you go and, and play with the VR goggles and then play yep. the games. Yeah, that so was cool. I got to do that too. So Awesome, man. Well, we fun. got we got some good footage of it. Definitely. So, guys, uh, check it out. Here it is. So, here we are at the Edge of Reality Virtual Arcade in Marquette, Michigan. Come here to pay per hour and join the worlds of many creative game designers. These worlds range from the dimension of Rick and Morty to first-person shooters like Robo Recall. You can also glide across mountaintops in a wingsuit or run away from zombies alongside your attack dog. Now, join me while I trade my reality for a virtual one.
thanks me. Warm welcome to the Millennial Show. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you having me. Yeah, no problem. Obviously, we're here for virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So we just want to know like your first experience with virtual reality. My first experience? Yeah. Um, I guess my first experience is when I bought a DK2. I remember the exact date. October 22nd, 2014. <laughs> so um, you're really excited, right? <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, I created a technology 10 years earlier, and I had to use the uh, huge projection screens. Um, and so when I saw the DK2 come out, all of a sudden my $100,000 solution could be a $1,000 solution. Oh, okay. So this is a new emerging technology. Yeah. It took me a month to, to just turn it on. It wow. Was so, it was so early that it was all buggy and it was really only for developers. So wow. it literally took me a month just to turn Probably it on. Probably not GUI or some sort of not a good interface. Yeah, it's terrible. Terrible. So it was like magic when it <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so why did you decide to open up Magic Reality? Well, uh, so we've been doing NeuroTrainer for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. which uses VR for cognitive medicine. And we're selling the product around the country around the world actually. Oh, wow. And so before we ship it, we have to test the equipment and through that process we've gotten kind of expert at VR and had the resources and the know-how. So you need a pretty powerful computer. It's a like good GPU card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Specialized equipment. Specialized equipment. You got it all, so might as well try it out. Huh? Yeah. And Give this little tunnel a little That's fun. how we met too, so right. what do you think the future would be for digital reality? Um, I believe virtual reality has pretty short life. I yeah. think it's going to be gone pretty soon, and it's going to be replaced by augmented reality okay, and then yes. mixed reality. Uh, people don't want to be isolated with goggles on, away from the real world. Yeah. They want the technology to be su uh, superimposed on top of reality. So like Pokemon Go was a great first example. example. I think that's where it's going. Yeah, so instead of just having a set square room where you're trying not to run into the walls, you're actually seeing stuff projected on the walls mm -hmm. and stuff like that around your house so you can walk around the actual world. Yeah, right? yeah. Like flat screens are a big market. Pretty soon there won't be a need for them because if you want to upgrade, you'll just put a 70-inch virtual TV on your wall. That's amazing. <laughs> so you own the place just next door, right? And you're on training. Yeah. And so what do you do with your patients there at Neural Training? We're creating a new industry called cognitive medicine. Um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. And there's now tools and techniques and technologies that can basically be physical therapy for the brain. So if you had a stroke or a concussion or some other uh, cognitive ailment, there's now ways to recover from that. Uh, or you go all the way to the other side of the spectrum and sell this to professional sports teams for performance enhancement. Like too. NFL and teams like that? Yep. For concussions? Wow, that's amazing. Yep. So is it all just visual, that this therapy? It, we use VR because the visual system is a very interconnected part, portion of the brain. And so when you do visual tasks, it's a really good entry point to get into the skull wow. and get to the other parts of the brain. Wow. So was that kind of a trial and error that you, that you came about this, or is this like a study in neuroscience right now? This, so our technology is honestly the greatest hits from the neuroscience laboratory. Really? We just the neuroscientists have been creating tasks for almost two decades now that they know uh, light up different parts of the brain, sure. require different cognitive abilities. And we. They, they've been underutilized for the real world. Most yeah. scientists are happy with just sitting in their lab and tweaking away at these little tasks. I just took them all and put them into a fun exercise. So you're applying it. Yeah. You found all this information, this big board of information, you're actually applying it to the real world and yeah. making it practical, which is really cool and innovating and you're very passionate about it. Dr. Jeff Nyquist, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, nice time with you. Yeah. So neurotrainer.com, what is that? His his website? Yeah, so it's his website where you can find out what he does. And okay. he explains like neuroplasticity on there, which is really what he's all about. 
and you can also order his his program online there, yeah and he also provides you with the hardware so like the oculus and the computer and there's separate packages you can go with but okay you can get training for i think it's determined by months or years okay and obviously the more time you put in the cheaper it is so. yeah i wonder what was that like you were you're a computer scientist was it really amazing to find out that you could hold a a very in-depth conversation because i mean you told me you held a very yeah. in-depth conversation with them even not when the camera was off was that yeah. surprising it was, it was very fascinating that i just didn't think i was at that level just to have like sit down and not know anything about uh cognitive therapy yeah neuroscience and just just learn so much so quickly he's a specialist man yeah he's a specialist. <clears throat> i was reading i was reading this book it's, it's off topic but it is a specialist at uh, writing which is Stephen King mm -hmm. and um, he you know you notice how all these people who become like specialists at something really uh, they have a way of telling you how it's done like they have their own take on it and it's very sure. unique in their own way like it's not cookie cutter the same and Stephen King I read this book it's called on writing I mm -hmm. think I was telling you about yeah, it. yeah you were telling me about that. and um, the way he the way he um, described writing was super unlikely like i would think that someone who's a writer is uh is an artist would would be like very very scattered and stuff but the way he approaches it is a very sit down method and just get make to make it very simple yeah he makes it really simple it's weird like he That's goes to too, right yeah and definitely like like most writers you would think uh they they basically preach against a lot of the stuff that you learn when you're taking a writing class because it's like you have to learn the rules and then in order to come up with your own style then you have to break the rules for sure but yeah, at the same time art form. you have to know the rules to to break them okay. so it was really cool so i was really into stephen king uh it was really cool i put together this uh little thing so check that out cool writing in general whether you're writing fiction non-fiction poetry or screenplays or wh whatever it may be it is an art form. There, there's no denying that. And it being an art form usually means there's not one particular way to go about it. And really that is like most things. However, it is definitely undeniable that throughout the course of history, there have been some people, some writers, that are just on a different planet than everyone else. And, and it shows in their work. And many of these writers have given their personal take on how the work is done, or how they did it, how it's done well. Now instead of pulling up Shakespeare or Melville or Hemingway, I want to focus on a writer that maybe next to these giants doesn't seem like much, but, but really does have an incredible career doing what he loves, and that is Stephen King. Now I'm sure a lot of you know him, they know the name, but he is an author of novels like The Shining, uh, Misery, the miniseries The Green Mile. Um, as you can see, all of these novels were adapted into films. And in fact, there are quite a few more, including The Shawshank Redemption, which was based on the novella he wrote called Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. And the movie is, is very well known widely throughout the whole entire planet. With that said, he's wrote and published over 50 novels, with like six of them being nonfiction. So he's mostly a, a, a fiction guy. But one of these nonfiction novels in particular, King dedicates half of it to describing how he thinks the craft is done well. And the book is called On Writing. So what was interesting to me about King's proposals in this book is how he worked himself. And he approaches writing in what you could call uh, like a get to work method where you set a quota for yourself every day until you meet those standards you don't do anything else. You, you don't let yourself. And this is wild because if you think of writing and break it down, it's basically just a form of creativity. And one thing about creativity is that it takes time to bring it to the surface, right? So King believes that if you just stay disciplined and of course take the time to learn the crafts, ins and outs, you will find your own style and the work will put itself together in a way that is, is your own. Uh, he even goes as far to say he's not a fan of developing a plot. Uh, but instead creates some characters, gives them a setting, and then watches what happens. A great line in the book is, I'm not only the author of the book, but I'm its first reader. And that's just that's just plain as day. Like, you never even think of that, but that's true. That's certainly true. 
So now, whether you think this method has something to it entirely depends on you. I'm not one to ever say that there is one way and one way only to do anything. But on the other side, Stephen King has got to be one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century. So it certainly works for him. And that's, that's all you can say for sure. Uh, so read that book, read on writing, and think for yourself. Look into what other writers have to say. I mean, I guarantee many of them are saying something completely different. And, and they can all have something to say, and they can all be right on some level, because they are all doing well. You're reading their book. But you got to read and you got to pull out what you think is, is got more substance to it and you draw your own conclusions. So like I said, think for yourself and find your own angle and then start creating. Well, like creativity actually doesn't always have to be an art form. Like they, they, they talk about like um, physicists being creative with their equations. It's kind of elegant and, and an art form as well. Sure. And, and even just figuring stuff out about your autonomic system as well. Yeah. Which, yeah, which brings us to Wim Hof. Yeah, exactly. And it's huge. pretty much how the cold taught him, like cold therapy. Mm -hmm. And just throwing himself in this pool of cold water and studying his body and breaking everything down and just learning how a breathing technique can yeah. like supercharge your body. Well, what does he say? The, that the cold is his God? Is that what he said? Yeah, the cold I is his God. I love it, man. Breathe, motherfucker! I know. I love it. <laughs> I remember awesome. when he first showed me the uh, the documentary, Ice man. man. Ice Man. Gotta check it on out. On YouTube, yeah. Oh, I was so inspired. Yeah. I was so inspired. Because I was so attached to comfort, I didn't realize it. Yeah. I was so... Just, yeah, I always wanted to be comfortable. Yeah, and it broke me away from comfort a lot. It did. I yeah. noticed that. You were always kind of very tolerant of discomfort, yeah. I noticed. But this pushed me the extra mile. Yeah. You know, next week I was fasting. And the week after that, it was winter camping. And yep. It was just I remember we, a lot of fun. It was funny. I told my dad, I was like, man, Joe got home. We watched a documentary. And then we he was like, all right, well, let's start taking cold showers all the time. And, and let's let's starve ourselves. And it was like, oh, my God, just the, you're just pushing me to do all these yeah. things. It was great. It was, it was a great experience. It was fun. Great. What um what is do you know how much of the science do you know behind his method? Well, I know that this breathing technique, you're actually breathing in more oxygen than anything else. And you're expelling your body of carbon dioxide. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So your cells are like overloaded for like premium gas basically if like for your car mm -hmm. you're like overloaded with oxygen to your cells and so the mitochondria which is you know the powerhouse of your cell yeah they're working like overload because they have all this oxygen mm -hmm. so they can you can actually go without breathing for quite a while because your, your body has so much oxygen at this time well and and the whole process is taking in oxygen and then just letting go but not really pushing it all out so you're taking a really really deep breath and then Exhaling just healing just, a just letting bit. go yeah that's how he like describes it. instead of going and blowing it all out just if you just let go of that breath you're you're holding a lot of it in but you're oh. you're reach you're able to take another deep breath okay and that's why yeah. he says breathe in and letting go over and over and you do breathe that for let go for like a minute or two minutes 30 to 40 breaths okay all right right yeah and then that's one set he said that you'd be able to hold your breath for like couple minutes couple minutes without you'd be able to go without air in your in your lungs yeah and then each set you would get better and better wow that's insane, insane. and you can even do push-ups after like when you're holding your breath yeah you actually feel a lot stronger oh, yeah yeah. So your muscles that. and stuff is provided with more oxygen and stuff so you can do more push-ups than normal yeah and you can do that even the first time well also explain this is I think this is really important too. the uh, study that he did where they they hooked him up. He went and he got like medical experiments on him mm. and they exposed him to like a bunch of viruses or something like that. Yeah. So and it was actually E. coli. Okay. It's a bacterial virus. And I don't know, whatever he was doing, his breathing technique, he was releasing a ton of adrenaline. Yeah. And this adrenaline was going into his system. And I guess he released more adrenaline than like somebody that goes um, bungee cording. Okay. It jumps off a cliff with a bunch of yeah. He like it was releasing more adrenaline wow. than that. Yeah, which is insane. They thought they thought he was they were they were doing these experiments and they thought, 
well, maybe he's kind of a genetically exceptional person where this is kind of, he's kind of a freak of nature in a way. Yeah. Because you get those. And what he did was he taught the same method to like, I think like it was like 20, 14 other Yeah, people. a dozen plus people. Yeah. And they all did it and they had the same results almost. Yeah. So none of them got sick from that E. coli That's and they got awesome. infected in the in the hospital that's amazing yeah well the, it, he's got a really cool story i guess um he got he went through a lot of hardship i guess his wife died and uh, i guess she i think she like committed suicide yeah he's and very open about it very too. open about it yeah and this kind of led him to uh to kind of look inward at the at this kind of healing mm -hmm. so very very interesting we got into it big time yeah we definitely. got into it big time we went to the pool and there's a really cold a waterfall there and we were doing the breathing techniques and we'd hop in there it's our cold shower testing our body so yeah. this is us fooling around at the pool doing the wim hof segment You know what the really cool thing about him is, man, is uh, he's got he's in this field where like, you know, there's already a lot of information that is kind of established and things that we think are impossible, like science books and everything. He always preaches against this, not preaches against, but he says, you know, you got to question the science books. And uh, he's had a lot of criticism from like a lot of well-respected, you know. Uh, genetic scientists yeah. before and before all the science was behind it yeah like people were just thinking he's some superhuman or he's just some freak of nature that yeah dives in ice and well we always we always water. look up to the people with credentials but this guy's actually doing it that's what i like about self -taught. it yeah very self-taught well i mean i think that as far as academia goes there is uh i mean it's it's good you know it's it, there's a lot of good things coming out of it sure. more than more than negative mm -hmm. but um I do see some flaws in the way it's taught, uh, especially in like a classroom setting. You know, we talk about that a lot about how, you know, uh, they just don't give you like a huge broad perspective of things. A lot of times, you know, they go into detail too much and they don't give you anything to, to kind of place all this knowledge in like a picture. Yeah. And uh, I was researching this, uh, this thing. It's an online uh, program that's for it's for free online course online course yeah okay. it's called the big history project it was uh it was inspired by david christian who is uh an american historian and uh he's also studies like i think it's russian history okay and russian history yeah he's a russian history scholar and stuff hmm. but he's a very very intelligent man and he this was i think it was his idea i don't know it's probably a bunch of other people too collaboration it, yeah it's funded by bill gates and uh it's it's great man it's everything we're talking about um it's it's free online they basically want it to be for uh like any teacher can go and get this curriculum and teach it in the classroom wow. um That's but really cool it's for anybody like we could wow. take it you anybody could take it right now for free online wow and get started you get a it's amazing you get a username and you're you're on your way wow you just and, gotta sign up huh? yeah and it's very broad man it's not a specific uh a specific name it's not a specific when you say field broad like what do you mean well it starts it's a they say it's they say if they, they had to categorize it they would categorize it i think it was like a social studies class on jet fuel okay but it's really cool but it's the 13 point i think it's like seven or eight billion yeah. year history of the universe and they check so everything it's everything man it's big bang it starts at the big bang wow it starts i, I clicked on started off doing it and i was like the birth of the universe, the Big Bang. Wow. And they, they start talking about that and they go in. And I guess what they do is they build up these uh, these concepts. They call them, I think, uh, thresholds of complete, uh, it's like complexity, like oh, increasing complexity. Okay. And uh, there's like eight that you will encounter throughout the whole course. And basically at the end, all of them summon to give you like today. 
like okay. of, of what the world and the universe looks like today. so it's literally just watching the universe evolve it's just a big book you man learn yeah as, as everything progresses yeah that's really what gives you the big picture you know i know that's what we preach about all the time is how important it is to have this big picture approach um and i i think it's great man i think i think it's awesome the uh i'll, I'll name off the thresholds actually no the thresholds are actually on the video here so you'll see the thresholds on this video that we got this is the uh the big history project inspired by american historian and russian history scholar david christian and funded by bill gates the big history project has spread its message a free and easy accessible online curriculum directed for educators students or anybody who is looking for answers aiming to answer the big questions like what am i and what am i a part of Big History hopes to inspire a greater love of learning and looks to help individuals better understand how we got here, where we're going, and how we fit in. A very broad perspective approach. When asked how you would categorize the course, the reply was a social studies class on jet fuel. However, the fundamental goal of this project is to provide a world-class, ready-for-the-classroom resource available to everyone everywhere for free. Big History Project is very unique in its nature and tells the 13.7 billion year story of the universe. A story that is always changing, a story with questions we have yet to answer. Throughout the journey you will encounter what they call thresholds of increasing complexity. A total of eight thresholds will be discovered by the end that come together to make up today's world. The Big Bang and the moment of origins, the stars light up, a chemically enriched universe, the formation of planets, life on earth, collective learning, agriculture, and the modern revolution. As you can see, the Big History Project covers a lot of landscape, filling in our picture of the cosmos and everything in it. That's pretty cool, ain't it, man? Yeah, it's yeah. really fascinating. You know, I noticed, too, um, most of the thresholds are dealing with the universe, like, outside of Earth. I mean, the Earth is a part of the universe, but it... it yeah, it makes sense because... I mean, Earth hasn't been in the grand scheme of things and humans for much time at all no. on the grand scheme, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it real, you realize, like, how important studying astronomy really is to having Definitely. that big picture. You're pretty much understanding the younger universe yeah. through astronomy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's the ultimate big view of everything. And, I, and then I think it like it definitely is going to go into the big view of the world and how everything works. Because people don't realize one thing is that to study the universe, you think you have to go out there. You have to go somewhere that's not here. But mm -hmm. we are the universe. We're part of the universe. Like everything around us is stardust, you know. It follows and, the same rules. Yeah. Stuff like that. As far yeah. as we know. Yeah. So, I mean, astronomy is is one of the most i think carl sagan said astro astronomy is like the most character building and humble experiences ever huh. really? and it's true man it, it really makes you feel small yeah that's for sure it does yeah. but i think a lot less wars and a lot less pollution and a lot less theft and like just just very low level stuff that humans participate in i think a lot less of it would happen if more people you know appreciated the stars and realized where we were and how yes. insignificant we are. Yeah. How much sure. it really doesn't matter. And yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, we went to um, we went to go see uh, our buddy Jeff, the juggler, the yeah, unicycle yeah, cowboy. Yeah, unicycle cowboy. And he's going he's to a riot. He is. He's going to school to be an astrophysicist, and that's really cool. And uh, he's uh, the second vice president of the Warren Astronomical Society, and they had this uh, summer. What was it? What's it called? The summer solstice solstice yeah june 21st so it's the longest day of the year yeah and they had that special event and that was cool we got to look at the sun yeah through a telescope it's kind of funny we picked the longest day of the year to go to astronomy club i know <laughs> well that's just because they had the event that day yeah but uh yeah i know it took forever for it to get dark yeah and just, but looking at the sun man that's that was cool that's insane yeah we were looking Those filters and we were looking through that telescope and you couldn't even see uh the entire the entire sun through no. the telescope that's insane you didn't have a lens that would zoom out enough i know that's crazy, that's crazy. And you could see what was it called like a solar sunspot sunspot yeah. yeah just a little black spot so how many earths can you fit in a sun something crazy just the core was like a million Jesus. something and it's not even uh, the, our star is not even a very big star what was no. it on the uh 
What's the chart called? That's the the life of a star. Yeah, yeah. The HR diagram. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, something like that. And uh, I mean, we were like a, a yellow shift or something like. That. I mean, we we were about to be red giant, like yeah. progressing towards one. But will we ever be a red giant? Is that? I don't, know. don't hold me to it, but I think yeah. so. I, th- I, don't know. I don't know. The life of a star is cr- that was the hardest, hardest section in astronomy was learning like the life cycles of stars and yeah. For me, it was. I mean, it was it was very fascinating, but it was just so, just detailed and just yeah. complex, man. But like, really, they're they are like the the creators of like all life. of all of life and like all of the el- most of the elements in it. I mean, it's just insane. Yeah. Without any stars, I mean, there's really there's nothing. There's no matter. No. It's insane, man. That's where the thing is. It's the powerhouse of the universe. Yeah. Well, I know we're hoping or we're going to. Uh, definitely bring the show to another astronomy club meeting where we'll be looking at like you know Saturn and Jupiter and the moon of course like that mm-hmm. but it was really cool to go there and see the observatory what'd you think yeah, of that that was amazing it was more than what I expected the size of that telescope and yeah uh, it was a refractor right uh was... a ref yeah, refractor. The one in the observatory. The one in the observatory was a refractor, which he said is mostly for uh, planetary observing. Anything that's really bright in the sky. Yeah, and then they had they had that huge reflector one. The dome. It was like twenty two inch diameter or something like that. Gibsonian. Yeah, man, that thing was insane. Yeah. That's for looking into like deep space at like nebulas and stellar nurseries and supernovas. Uh, that oh, like galaxies. Well, the thing is about galaxies. I was talking to Jeff. You were too. That through a telescope, anyone that you're going to buy, um, you can't, they're so big and how light travels at a certain speed that they're so big that some of the light is getting here uh, quicker than some of the other lights in the galaxy. So like the stars in, in the front of the galaxy facing wherever you're observing is a lot younger than the stars back be- end. in the back end. So it's so wide. It's like a hundred thousand light years. Yeah. It's, plus it's crazy. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so like I guess when you look at a galaxy through the telescope, like if you look at the Andromeda galaxy, um, you basically just get the center image. You just get a fuzz ball of the center and you're looking at it, but I guess I guess uh if you did look if you could see all the stars, if it wasn't so faint of the Andromeda because it is so far away. If you could see it in our sky, it would like be more than like I think it was like four moons across. It would be huge. You just it would you would see it all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's really it's it's so far away, and we are on a collision course with it too. That's what's that's what's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, we had a lot of fun there. Man. That was that was so fun. That was awesome. I, yeah. I couldn't wait to get you out there. So check this out. This is the Warren Astronomical Society, the summer solstice. Solstice. Summer solstice. So, okay. All right, here we are at the uh, Warren Astronomical Society, and where are we at? Uh, we're in Ray, Michigan. Ray, Michigan, at okay. At the Wilcott Mills Metro Park. Okay, awesome. What do we got here behind us? So this is our observatory. Um, we've been here since the early 70s. Yeah. Uh, but the, it's gone through some renovations. Some things haven't, but uh, let's, let's... Yeah, let's check it out. It out. Um, which basically has two axes of rotation. If you look at this this wheel here, and then there's another one up there, this is called right ascension, and that's called declination. If you extend Latin long out into the sky, it's, it's moving. And so you, you don't want that because you're trying to direct someone to a certain part of the sky, and so your, your coordinate system can't be moving. For sure. So we have a separate one for the celestial sphere that's called right ascension and declination. This is a tiny telescope that if we actually have the dome opened up here, we look through here and we can actually adjust this to be right on the North Star. The Earth's rotating like this, and so if we have a scope that's aligned with this pole, and we rotate it around this axis, whatever it's pointed at, if it's going at the right speed, it'll just stay on that object. It already knows where Mars is going to be in 30 years. Right. Because 
the orbits are really stable. So it doesn't have to actually track anything, it just, it's numerical values, you're going here, and it, and it knows, okay, I'm going to move 15 degrees this way and 25 degrees this way, and I'll be where you told me to be. We spent hours in here just splitting doubles and uh, We're splitting listening, doubles. listening to jazz music. So uh, visual binaries are, it literally looks like two stars next to each other, yeah. but there's some that are really close, yeah. so you need a very nice instrument to split them. Yeah. Crummy scope like mine, it looks like one star. Right. You look at it through this thing, it looks like two. There's guys that know the sky and know their scopes well enough that they can tell how clear the sky is by what doubles they can split. So, oh, I'm not splitting this one? Uh, usually I can split it. So it means that the sky is a little bit crummier than what it was, you know, the last time they looked. Yeah. Eclipsing binaries. Okay. So that's where you have two stars of different brightnesses. And so when the dimmer one passes in front of the brighter one, the whole system dims. And then when it goes behind it, it dims even more. Well, it depends on the brightness of each individual, but basically you get a light curve that has these dips in it. So what does that particularly do? So this uh, puts the lens in kind of a bucket. So the, the moisture has to travel all the way down into this tube to get to the lens. Okay. Whereas if the lens is just exposed to the open air, it'll condensate and then you get crappy scene. On some smaller scopes it's not uncommon to see dew heaters and dew shield. I mean, people have like their scope wrapped in blankets that are actually heating it to keep it at a wow. stable temperature. Just have to find focus. There it is. Take a look. Shed. This is called the Dop Shed. This is this? It's the clubs. You guys get this recently? No, we've had it. I didn't see it here last time. Oh, that is a 22-inch mirror that, man, if I remember correctly, it's this is index on it. close to 200 pounds or so. The mirror is? Yeah, something like that. Now, the last thing you want to do is clean a mirror. It, right. it, unless it's really bad, you just leave them alone. Keep it all covered up. Yeah, man, that was cool. That was that, that was, was fun. really cool experience. I had a lot I of won't fun. Forget that for sure. Yeah, well, I'm having so much fun, man, just going to see all these new and unique people and just checking out what their life is about and it's how very stimulating, passionate they are. Very that passion, man. It's really inspiring. Yeah, it's really inspiring. Well, that's that's all we did so far. So that was awesome. You want to get out of here? Yeah, it's kind of late, man. I'm hungry too. Yeah, let's go get some food or make some food. Let's make some food. Yeah. All right. Thank you.